بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so we're now resuming our uh, seerah after a break of around how much three and a half months now just about three and a half months so inshallah we're resuming and we have to recap and uh, we're actually going to basically uh, go a little bit back because I feel that we were rushed through when we did the battle of Hunayn and Ta'if and I didn't really talk about some of the main points of benefit. And if you remember, we had talked about at least six uh, lessons about the conquest of Mecca. Uh, and this occurred in which month and which year? Everybody should know without looking at any notes. This is general knowledge. Which month and which year did the conquest of Mecca take place? Ramadan of? Eighth year of the Hijrah. Ramadan of the eighth year of the Hijrah. We mentioned that of the most important products or the most important uh, repercussions of the conquest is that the entirety of the Quraysh by and large eventually converted to Mecca. Some of them immediately, others it took a while, such as Abu Sufyan, such as uh, Suhail ibn Amr, Ikram ibn Abi Jahl. But eventually, basically all of the elite of the Quraysh eventually accepted Islam. And after the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet wasallam also destroyed the neighboring idols. Uh, that that were in the neighboring cities around Mecca. And he then heard of an f- offensive by the largest tribe after the Quraysh, and the most prestigious tribe after the Quraysh, that is the tribe of Thaqif in Ta'if. The tribe of Thaqif in Ta'if decided to attack the Muslims when they were in Mecca. And the Prophet heard that Thaqif had allied with their cousins of Hawazin. Taqif are the people living in the city of Ta'if. Hawazin are their cousins biologically, basically going back a few generations around the neighboring of Ta'if. So Taqif and Hawazin are the two tribes that are rivaling Quraysh in Mecca. And they decided that they're going to launch an offensive against the Muslims, over 20,000 people. And the Prophet ﷺ decided to then engage with them in war. And so the Ansar and the Muhajirun, along with the New co- <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Along with the new converts from Mecca, they engaged in the battle of what is the battle called? The battle of Hunayn. They engaged in the battle of Hunayn, and the Quran mentions how many battles by name? Quiz. Two battles by name. Two battles by name, and then Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the Confederates Ahzab, and we call it the Battle of Ahzab, but it's not called the Battle of Ahzab in the Quran. Allah says that Laqad Nasrakun Allah Bibadirin. Allah helped you at Badr. And then Allah says, Wayawma Hunainin on the day of Hunain. So Allah mentions two battles in the Quran, Badr and Hunain. And we learned uh, when we talked about the Battle of Hunain that initially the Muslims, especially the new converts, they fled and they ran away. And the Prophet and the senior uh, Sahaba remained until eventually the counter-offensive was uh, launched and the Battle of Hunayn was a resounding success. The Battle of Hunayn was a resounding success and the tribe of Hawazin, what happened with them? What happened with the tribe of Hawazin? Remind, remind me. The men fled. The men fled and... They left the women and the property and the belongings. And so the entire tribe of Hawazin and also large segments of Thaqif. Because if you remember what happened from the tribe of Ta'if Thaqif, what happened was that the younger, the younger overzealous commander said what? Leave the castle and fort and bring all the women and children with them. Right? And the elder said, that's foolish. But the younger uh, said, no, we're going to go ahead and bring our women and children, our properties, everything, put them on the battlefield. This was a very, very foolish move for them. It turned out to be obviously Allah's qadr and an advantage for the Muslims. And the entire property was then confiscated by the Muslims as uh, ghanima. And this was the largest ghanima in the history of the seerah. Nothing was larger than the ghanima of Hunayn, because the tribe of Hawazin and Thaqif, their properties, their women, their children, their uh, the, the the camels, everything, they was then conquered by the Muslims. Now, I want to now go back and derive some benefits from the uh, battle of Hunayn and the siege of Ta'if. We also mentioned the Prophet Sallam camped outside the city of Ta'if and. Uh, it was not uh, success at that point in time, and the Prophet eventually then returned to Medina, and he said, "Allah will guide them to Islam." 
He said Allah will bring them sooner or later and we'll talk about when they converted. Uh, that will be in the ninth year of the Hijrah. So in two, three weeks we'll get to the conversion of the people of Ta'if. Now, what are some of the main benefits from the battle of Hunayn? First and foremost, neglecting the primary cause of victory. What, was, what is the primary cause of victory? Trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the primary cause of victory. As Allah says that in yansurkum Allah fala ghalib lakum if Allah helps you nobody can conquer you. What does Allah say that the Quran put their trust in on the day of Hunayn? Their numbers. Wa yawma Hunaynin id a'jabatkum kathratukum. On that day they had a confidence and therefore a tawakkul in other than Allah. They put their trust in other than Allah. And what was this trust that they put in other than Allah? They put it in the number, in the quantity that they had. And this shows us a very important point of aqidah, of theology, of tawheed. Our tawakkul has to be in musabbibul asbab and not in the sabab. Let me repeat that. Our tawakkul must be in musabbibul asbab, that's Allah. That means the, the one who causes the cause. And not in the sabab or the cause itself. If our tawakkul is put into the cause, rather than the one who causes the cause, then this is a type of shirk. It's called minor shirk generally. And there are many examples that are given. So if you uh, uh, have an alarm system in your house, and you turn it on and you feel khalas, the alarm system will protect me. This is not shirk akbar that will make you a mushrik. You're not worshipping the alarm system, right? I hope we're not, nobody in the world will worship the alarm system, right? But we say this is hidden shirk or minor shirk. That your tawakkul becomes in the alarm. Does that mean you don't turn the alarm on? Obviously not. You turn the alarm on. But then what's your tawakkul in? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like when you're sick and going to the doctor, your tawakkul is in Allah, but then you realize Allah has given this doctor the tools, the mechanism, the knowledge that I don't have. I have to go to the doctor, but it is Allah who will bring the shifa and not the doctor or the medicine that will uh, itself, in and of itself, cause the shifa. So if you put your tawakkul in the sabab, this is not going to get you to the end result. This is a very important point in all of our affairs of life. Your job, your degree, your education, your qualifications, all of this is a sabab. Allah has given it to you. You put your tawakkul in that, then this is a type of shirk. It could be major shirk if you deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is inshallah not possible amongst the Muslims, right? But if, if the person denies Allah, a non-Muslim, and he says, oh, this is all from me. So for example, the story of the man in the two gardens, right? When his brother said to him, this is from Allah, what did the guy say? This is from me. Qarun, what did he say? This is from me. Innama utitu ala ilmin indi. I was the businessman who managed to get this money. Right? And so he's a kafir. That he's neglected Allah. He's basically gotten rid of the musabbib al-asbab in his mind. And he makes himself the cause. You understand here? So the one who eliminates musabbib al-asbab completely, and he makes the sabab, he makes it the ultimate cause, this is when it becomes shirk and kufr. Is that clear? Right? Inshallah, in the mind of the Muslim, this is not possible. Therefore, it's not going to be major shirk and kufr, but it is still a problem or a sin, and it will not bring us success. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Hunayn. On the day of Hunayn, they put their tawakkul in the cause, and therefore what happened, they did not get to the end result. Now, by the way, I have to mention here, there are two types of causes. There's a physical cause, and there's a spiritual cause. What is a physical, what is a spiritual? A physical cause is a cause that humanity understands and believes in regardless of religion. For example, medicine. For example, job and education. For example, strength. For example, the alarm system. Do you have to believe, be of a particular belief to practice medicine? Everybody practices medicine. This is a physical cause. A spiritual cause is a cause that is supernatural. It's not a natural cause. It's supernatural. And therefore, you have to believe in a certain methodology, ideology, cult, religion, in order to do that. So, if you are in a certain part of the world, you will go to the shaman. Right? The North American Indians had their shamans. Right? Or if you are a Hindu, you will go to the pundit. And you will, he will read something over you. This is supernatural cause. This isn't medicine. Right? This is a spiritual cause. You understand this point here, right? We as Muslims have our spiritual causes. For example, what? Dua, 
Quran. I mean, all of these are spiritual causes. Now, the reason I say this, a spiritual cause, if it is legitimate, can you put your trust in the spiritual cause? Can your heart be attached to aluk? To the spiritual cause. We said your heart should not be attached to a natural cause. Is that clear? Everybody is that clear? This is aqidah, it's not even sirah now. This is theology. Your heart should not have tawakkul, ta'alluq with a, with a physical cause. You go to the doctor, you realize I have to go to the doctor. But your heart is attached up there. Okay, can your heart be attached to a spiritual cause? That's my question. So why is it allowed? Because the spiritual cause by definition is what? It's connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So to have your heart ta'alluq with the spiritual cause is tawheed. To have your heart with ta'alluq, with, with, with tawakkul to a physical cause, it goes against tawheed. Is that clear here? Right? So we learned this from the incident of uh, Hunayn that we don't put our trust in physical causes. Now, of course, physical causes are necessary. In that, Allah created them to be causes. Right? With the famous hadith of tie the camel and then put your trust in Allah. This is the basis. This is the basis. اعقلها وتوكل. We do the physical causes. We go to the doctor. We put the alarm system on. We do a degree education. We find our job. But then the heart is attached with Allah. اعقلها وتوكل. Memorize the simple uh, hadith of the Prophet and you'll understand. So we put our tawakkul in Allah while we do the physical causes. Okay, that's one point we learn about from the battle of Hunayn. Another very important important point of theology of aqidah and i glossed over it and i want to just mention this a little bit more uh, uh, in detail and that is we excuse people even for major shirk and kufr out of ignorance if a person is genuinely ignorant but they say they're a muslim they believe they're a muslim and then they fall into blatant shirk and kufr and they don't even know it's shirk and kufr it is possible Allah will forgive them because they're jahil, they're ignorant. This is a very important theological point. And we learn this from the hadith of Abu Waqid al-Layfi. That on, when they were exiting from Mecca on the way to Hunayn, they saw that good luck tree that used to be an idol. And they would hang their weapons on that idol tree. It was a tree that was an idol, right? There was a beautiful majestic tree with branches hanging out. And they would hang their weapons on those branches. And they would think that with these now weapons, we will now win in the battle. So Abu Waqad al-Layfi, he's just converted yesterday. Conquest of Makkah took place. Today he's on his way to Hunayn. Doesn't know anything. Hasn't memorized Quran. Hasn't studied Aqidah fiqh. Nothing. He goes and he says, Ya Rasulullah, can't you make for us this type of idol too? Can't you make for us that one what? We used to have one in the days of Jahiliyyah. Why don't you make another idol for us? Another, he didn't say idol, but he said a good luck charm. That to what? So this is major kufr. You're asking for another idol. And our Prophet ﷺ said it is major shirk. He said, I swear by Allah you have asked me exactly what Bani Israel asked Musa when they were saved from drowning and Fir'aun and they went onto the shore and they saw an idol being worshipped. They said, O Musa, اِجْعَلْ لَنَا إِلَهًا كَمَا لَهُمْ آلِهَا Make for us a God like they have a God. Right? So the Prophet said, Wallahi you have said exactly this. And that's major shirk. But did he say, O Abu Waqid, repeat your shahada again, you just became a kafir, repent and accept Islam again? Did he say that? No. Why? Because he's a brand new Muslim. He doesn't know any better. So, this is very important because we are now living in a time when we hear such strange views amongst even Muslims that are born into Islam. But they're raised in, in this land or whatever land and they don't know even the basics of the religion. And they come forth sometimes with blatant kufr. And there are so many examples. The most obvious example is the notion of anybody who is good will be going to heaven. Doesn't matter what you believe, right? You can be agnostic, atheist, idol worshipper, you can be the Ahli Kitab, anything. If you're a good person, all paths lead to Jannah. This is a, a common notion of our times. And to say this is kufr akbar. It goes against la ilaha illallah because you are saying 
There are gods that can be worshipped besides Allah. You understand? It goes against the kalima. It goes against Muhammad Rasulullah because you're saying somebody who denies Muhammad Rasulullah will go to Jannah. Right? It goes against both the kalimas. You have negated your kalima when you say all paths lead to Jannah. And yet, if you were to ask and do a survey, even may Allah protect us in our own community of teenagers. Wallahi, even not just teenagers. Do a survey of many and they will say, oh yes, if you're good. Now in Islam, you have to be good theologically and action-wise. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Right? So, instead of saying, oh, these are all kafir. No. The person who says this is an ignorant Muslim. He doesn't know any better. And inshallah, he might be forgiven. He will be the Muslim who says this, right? He will be forgiven because there is aslul iman in his heart. Meaning, what is aslul iman? He wants to submit to Allah and His Messenger. Is that, that clear? That is aslul iman. You want to submit to Allah and His Messenger. What is aslul kufr? You don't want to submit like Iblis. Aba was takbar. You don't want to submit. That is the aslul kufr. Aslul iman, you want to submit, but you don't know what you have to submit to. You don't know that you cannot have that to unwalt. You don't know that only one path leads to Jannah. So such a person who believes himself to be a Muslim, then commits a major mistake, even a kufr, even shirk, and they're ignorant, that person will not be held accountable for their ignorance, rather they must be taught and must be educated. These days we have again so many issues, uh, gender orientation for example, many of our second generation are saying, what's the big deal if somebody has this orientation or that? It's okay, let them do that. They, well, this is a very common thing now. And we say no. To say this is okay, it's like saying it's okay to drink alcohol. To say it's okay to drink alcohol is kufr. To drink alcohol is not kufr. But to say it's okay to drink alcohol is kufr. You see the difference, right? To legitimize haram is kufr. To commit haram is haram, it won't be kufr. And now we have a lot of these trends, especially in our second generation, to the elders and to those, we say calm down. Yes, it is kufr, but just like Abu Waqid al-Layfi, we have to deal with them in a gentle manner. They don't just make blanket, you know, oh, this is, you're not a Muslim anymore. No, you have said something that is un-Islamic, but you will be corrected inshallah with wisdom and manners like our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. Another point of benefit from the battle of Hunayn <coughs> is that even the best of people can be swayed by worldly desires, by power, by ambition, by desire for wealth. It is is not in and of itself a sign of lack of iman to have desires of this world and to be swayed by those desires. But the, the true iman comes when you are reminded, are you kept in check? When somebody reminds you, when you are shown the truth, can you put yourself in check? And this is, we see it in the Prophet Yusuf salam that the Quran explicitly says he desired her. It is not in and of itself haram to have that natural inclination. You want now, where do, by the way, where, where am I getting this from, from Hunayn? What happened in the battle of Hunayn that clearly showed that even some of the Sahaba, they had a natural urge and desire and they said something that was not appropriate. Who remembers? Going back three and a half months. When the, very good. When the Ansar felt somehow that the Prophet had not done justice. When all the money was given to the new converts, when all the money was given to Abu Sufyan and, and uh, Al-Aqra ibn Habis and all of these new converts, and the Ansar said their statement that really demonstrated how disappointed they were in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi in and of itself that's very dangerous. To be disappointed in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, actually it is a type of kufr. But they're human beings in the end of the day. What did they say? They said, when it comes to the call for war, we are the first on the line to be called. When it comes to money being given, he gives it to his relatives and family, the Quraysh. You understand this point, that when happen, what happened in Hunayn, <laughs> that money was given to the new converts. And how much money? By the millions, right? A hundred thousand camel here, ten thousand dinars there. This is like a massive amount. From being a pauper, you will become the, the one percent elite, quite literally. You will become the 1% elite. The people that were given these Abu Sufyan and, and the elite of the Quraysh, they became in our, in our vernacular, millionaires overnight. That's how much money was given to them. Wallahi, any one of us, we would have lost our minds over there. That these people have 
opposed us, fought us, tried to kill us for 20 years. We have defended Rasulullah Now when the money is given, where are we? Not even called. Not even one penny was given to the Ansar. Think about it. Not even one penny was given to the Ansar. What do you think is going to happen? Wallahi, they said one word, what would we have done? Put yourself in those shoes, right? And so they said their statement. And what does this demonstrate? The Sahaba are humans. And I say this because we have a problem. Many of the ignorant Muslims, we make the Sahaba into angels. And when we make the Sahaba into angels, they cannot be role models for us anymore. Because they're not human anymore. The Sahaba are the best generation of human beings. Kuntum khayra ummatun ukhrijat linnas. They're human beings. They wanted money like I want money and you want money. All of us want money. They wanted it like all of us wanted. But they were kept in check. When the Prophet ﷺ heard, he then called them into that tent and he said, make sure nobody is there other than you. Get rid of all of the non-ansar. I'm going to speak only to you, speak frankly. And he gave that moving lecture that moved them all to tears. And he said that, are you not happy that people are going back to their homes with gold and silver in their hands and you are going back to your home with Rasulullah ﷺ amongst you? Are you not happy? Isn't that better than gold and silver? And he said, I am one of you. I'm not one of them. Because they, their claim was, he remembers his family. And he says, ansar. I am an Ansari. And were it not for my birth and lineage, I mean, I can't help, I was born there, right? I would have been of the Ansar. And if all of mankind went one direction, and the Ansar went the other, I would go with the Ansar. What beautiful words. Wallahi, wallahi imagine. right? And the Ansar, that was what they needed to hear. They were sobbing and crying, and they begged Rasulullah for forgiveness. This is Iman. The fact that they had the waswasa doesn't mean that they don't have Iman. We can all have waswasa. We can all have shaitan give us those thoughts. In and of itself to have an inclination, that's not, that's not a sign of lack of faith or weak faith, but to control the inclination, to be reminded and then remember, right? That's what our Prophet ﷺ said. That the mu'min, he can be da'if. But the mu'min, إِذَا ذُكِّرَ ذَكَرْ When he's reminded, he remembers. When he's given some admonition, he opens his eyes and sees. And this is what we see of the uh, Sahaba as well. They were human beings. They were swayed like all humans would be swayed, but then they tempered that, they controlled it, and this is the role model that we have with the Ansar. Also of the benefits of the battle of Hunayn, of the benefits of the battle of Hunayn, we see over and over again that our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is dealing with people according to their backgrounds and their personalities and their levels. He's dealing with people according to their backgrounds and personalities and levels. Look at how he dealt with the Ansar. He didn't give them a penny and he gave all of them to the new converts of the Quraysh. Look at how he dealt with the Quraysh in the battlefield when the Quraysh fled. When the Quraysh fled. He used a war slogan that he had never used before or after that. What was the war slogan that he used on the battlefield of Hunayn in Arabic? <laughs> I just, when I saw your hand, I just said in Arabic. Just kidding. Okay, in English or in Urdu. Go ahead. He called upon his lineage. And he had never done this in any previous battle. In fact, now what was, this, what was the war slogan? Ana nabiyu la kadhib. I am the Prophet, there is no denying that. I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. Now this is what you call the master of human psychology. The notion of who your father and grandfather is, what does our religion teach us? It has the potential to become major sin, maybe even kufr. Kibr. It has the potential to become something of jahiliyyah. When you, and that's what our Prophet ﷺ said, that four things of jahiliyyah will always remain from my ummah. Number one of these four, al-fakhru bil-ansab. Being proud of your nasab. Now, what is happening right now in Hunayn? Astaghfirullah, our Prophet ﷺ is not disobeying himself. He can't, he's the Rasulullah. So what's he doing then? He's not being proud of his nasab. But is it wrong to say who your father and grandfather is? It's true. Is he not the grandson of Abdul Muttalib? Yes. So he's using something on that battlefield that needs to be used with these new converts from the Quraysh. The one person that would bring that memory back. Who is your leader? He's not a foreigner. He's not a stranger. This is the grandson of your legendary chieftain. 
And he says, Anabnu, the son, because you can call the son the grandson. You can call the grandson the son, excuse me. You can call the grandson the son. He said, I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. So the same thing can be applied in our times for, for example, nationalism, right? For example, nationalism. Oh, isn't it uh, tomorrow, Pakistan National Day, right? <laughs> tomorrow, right? Yes. yes, okay, mashallah. So, and the day after that is India as well, mashallah, right? Not too much happy faces there, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So the issue of nationalism, exactly what we're talking about here. It's a new concept, I've said this many times, but is there anything inherently wrong with ascribing yourself to a geographic region? You are from a certain land, have a certain culture, have a certain cuisine, what not. So if it is used improperly, it can become kufr, it can become sin. But if it is used within, and that's why the war slogan was number one, أَنَا النَّبِيُّ لَا كَذِبْ That goes first. I am the Prophet. There's no denying that. And then after that, I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. So ascribing himself, and this again shows us uh, psychology. Now, so he's dealing with the Ansar in this way. He's dealing with the, the new converts in this way. He's dealing with the Bedouins in a different way. The Bedouins, uh, after the battle of Hunayn, when the Bedouins came begging for money, he did not give the average Bedouins what he gave the chieftains of Quraysh. The chieftains of Quraysh got fortunes. Do you think these Bedouins got fortunes? No, he just gave them you know, tokens here and there. Whatever it was, until everything was finished. The, the millions and millions that he had, you know, probably, probably 10 million estimate, I mean, rough ballpark figure, that much amount of money, all of it was distributed in one day, one day. And he didn't keep one penny for himself or for the elite of the Muhajun and Ansar. None of them got anything. All of it was given. Now the, the, the Bedouins that came, they got whatever was there until finally all of this 10 million was finished. And the Bedouins continued to come in. Free money. They're coming in. Until, as the hadith mentions, the Prophet was surrounded by a group of Bedouins. And they were demanding money, 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 give us money. And all of the throng forced him back into, uh, there was a, uh, a group of trees with thorns over there, the, 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 the desert shrubs. And they pushed him back to the desert shrubs. And of course, because these are Muslims, I mean, they're saying they're Muslims and we're not supposed to test you know, their hearts and whatnot. So the Sahaba are not acting like bodyguards now because these are Muslims demanding money. And they pushed our process and back into the, the, the shrubbery so much so that his upper shawl was basically caught in that and fell down onto the floor. And the Prophet ﷺ said, hand me my cloak back. Give me my is my my rida my my upper garment back for wallahi if I had coins or gold as much as the thorns of all of these shrubs I would have distributed to the last of you and you would not have found me stingy or miserly now he's obviously frustrated so I said he has every right to be he has every right to be with this group but they're not being treated the way that the elite of the Quraysh are being treated right so our religion teaches us common sense. We treat people according to their backgrounds. And I say this because once again, many innocent Muslims have a naive notion that, oh, we treat everybody the exact same way. No, you treat a dignitary, you treat a VIP in a manner that is, per, that is conducive to that. And you treat the, the Bedouin who's treating the Prophet rudely, you treat him differently. Nothing wrong with that. There's a hadith, the first hadith of Sahih Muslim in the Muqaddim and the introduction that Aisha says, أَمَرَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم أَن نُنَزِّلَ النَّاسَ مَنَازِلَهُمْ Our Prophet commanded us to treat with people according to their own level. So look at how he's dealing with different people in a different uh, way. Also, of the benefits of the Battle of Hunayn, is the issue of making dua for versus against people. For versus against people. And again, I want to clear up a number of misconceptions because uh, as you know from my talks, inshallah, from the seerah, I'm not an apologist. I don't sugarcoat. I don't paint a picture that. I, inshallah, the point is I want to be faithful to our tradition because I always believe honesty is the best policy. You tell the truth as it is. And then if somebody does not like it, that's not our business to, to, to change it. And if we have a false understanding of the seerah, this is going to cause us harm in the long run. If we have an image of the Sahaba, or even of the Prophet that's not true, then we discover something in the books, in, in our tradition. This will lead to a crisis of faith. It is better we just be open about it, and teach the people the reality. So, another common misconception. You are never ever allowed to be harsh with anybody, and you're never allowed to make dua against somebody. This is completely wrong. When the, the Sahaba 
finished the siege of Ta'if and they gave up and they wanted to leave, they begged the Prophet to make dua against Thaqif. Is that not true? Right? They begged the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, make dua against Thaqif. Why? Because Thaqif were so stubborn. Because they have been here for two weeks now, according to some reports, and Muslims have died, and the Thaqif were the ones who set the trap up, uh, you know, with the help of Hawazin, and, you know, the Muslims are on an all-time high after the conquest of Mecca. All these big highs, Thaqif brings it all down. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, make dua against the Thaqif. Now, let me ask you, what year are we in right now? Eighth year. Do you think the Sahaba are asking something new? They've never, they never heard the process of make dua against somebody. They know this is possible. They know that sometimes you make dua against a person. And, and they have seen this in previous incidents. Can anybody give me an example from the seerah that the process of made dua against somebody? When the Asr prayer was delayed, he made dua against the Ahzab. What, what else? Against the group that put the, 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 the carcass on him by name. And every one of them was killed in Badr. Which tribes? Which incidents took place where the entire tribe, Quran was revealed? Qarra and Ma'una and uh, Raji'ah. All of these incidents, Qatalu Sahaba, all of this, the, the Quran was revealed. And for one month, the Prophet made dua against groups of people. And I say this because subhanAllah, sometimes when we hear a, a da'i, a scholar, a shaykh, make dua against one of the taghiyas, one of the ty- fir'auns of our time, right? Somebody will come and say, don't you know, akhi, it's against Islam to make dua against, uh, you know, against somebody. SubhanAllah, the Qur'an is full of this. Did not Musa make dua against Fir'aun? Did not Nuh make dua against his own people? Now one can say, but the opposite is also mentioned, that... Ibrahim and Isa made dua for their peoples that were misguided, right? Ibrahim and Isa, and if you look at the history of, I mean, the uh, the personalities of the of the of the Anbiya, Ibrahim and Isa were the tender-hearted ones. Nuh and Musa were the more stricter ones, like Abu Bakr and Umar, right? Like Abu Bakr and Umar type of personalities, which shows us, yes, both are there. No doubt, the general rule you make dua for. But sometimes it is healthy and necessary to make dua against. And therefore in our times there are many tyrants. The tyrant of Syria, the modern, the modern pharaoh. Is it not Islamic to make dua against him? Wallahi it is. Now if somebody were to say, Oh Allah, guide this person to Islam. Is that wrong? No, that's not wrong. It's okay. You can also say, Oh Allah, guide this person to Islam and make him a good Muslim stop his tyranny and inju- tyranny and injustice. Yes, it is jais. But the one who makes dua against after all that he's done, that's also jais. And in fact, that is the more logical thing to do. In any case, uh, the point is that it's not un-Islamic, right? And I want to just make that that point over there because we have again this notion that we can never make dua against a tyrant or a dhalim. In fact, what are all of the ahadith of da'watul mazlum? And this is dua against a Muslim. If a Muslim has done dhulm to you, if a Muslim has stolen your money, confiscated, uh, embezzled, if a Muslim has uh, dishonored you, that spread slanders and lies, knowing it's a slander and lie, Islamically, Quranically, you are allowed to make dua against this person by name. By name, you can make dua against. And our Prophet ﷺ said, that da'watul mazlumi yustajabula. The dua of the one who has done wrong, that laysa bayna wa Allahi hijab. There is no... Hijab, there is no barrier between uh, that person and Allah, his dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means what? You can make dua even against a Muslim. How about uh, a taghiya, a fir'aun of our times? Of course we can make dua against such people. So if some people make dua for such people that Allah makes them better and guides them, that is fine and permissible. And if somebody makes dua against them, that, oh Allah, destroy these people who are killing and murdering. Oh Allah, show them, show us your power through their destruction. This too is jaiz and it is from the sunnah. Now, what did our Prophet do with Ta'if? Did he did he make dua for them or against them? For them. So it shows that, yes, the general rule, yes, you should be merciful. And especially when uh, the people of Ta'if have already done what they've done and he forgave them in the past. Why should he not forgive them uh, again? So that's another uh, benefit from uh, the, the incident of Hunain. Yet another benefit from the incident of Hunain is wisdom in 
dealing with past offensive, should you punish people for past offensives or forgive them? We have in the Battle of Hunain a major crime that took place. The new Muslims fled the battlefield. This is a major crime, a major sin. In fact, our Prophet ﷺ said, seven are the deadly sins. اجتنبوا سبع المبقات. Seven are the deadly sins. One of them is, وَالتَّوَلِّي يَوْمَ الزَّحْ To turn away and flee on the battlefield, the day of the battlefield. And these groups of new Muslims, what did they do? They fled the battlefield. That's a major sin. One of the seven deadly sins. And therefore, Umm Sulaim, uh, and Umm Sulaim, of course, is one of the famous Sahabiyat. Umm Sulaim, when they all fled, she in fact jumped off of her animal and she's in the women's section. And she runs to the Prophet and she pulls out, she's a woman, she doesn't have the sword, she pulls out a hand dagger. Right? So amongst the small group of men, you have Umm Sulaim. And the Prophet looks at her and the Sahaba of goes, what, what is this dagger? What is this? And she says, if anybody comes, I'm going to shove it in his stomach. See what anybody can do. This is the bravery of Umm Sulaim. So when... Everything calms down, the battle is won. Umm Sulaim, she's angry now. Because she's the one that had to run from the women's section to the Prophet ﷺ, And she says, Ya Rasulullah, execute all of those cowards. Who is she talking about? The ones who fled. Get, execute them, they deserve the death penalty. They were the ones who, the khawana, they, they, they betrayed you. right? Execute all of them. And the Prophet ﷺ said that, O oh, Umm Sulaim, Allah Azza wa Jal qad kafa wa ahsan. He took care of us, He defended us, and Alhamdulillah everything is fine and done with. Meaning, yeah, they did a sin and crime, but now we're going to kill a thousand people now? We're going to execute all of them? So here we find wisdom in dealing. This is a major offense. But now the done deal is a done deal. What will you gain by by retribution, by criminal offense, let it be, move on. The past is the past, as the saying goes, and no use crying over spilt milk. And this shows us the wisdom of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also of the benefits of the Battle of Hunayn, and we see this over and over again, the Prophet ﷺ uses not just physical means, not just spiritual means, he uses psychological means as well. He uses psychological means as well, which shows us that, subhanAllah, you need to understand the human psyche to get your stuff done. A leader cannot be a leader unless he knows how to deal with the human situation and the human psyche. And there are so many examples for this. Uh, and in the Battle of Hunayn, uh, two examples come to mind as well. Uh, the, one of the, the longer one will mention that now is that the 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 tribe of uh, the tribe of Hawazin. What happened to them? Eventually, they accepted Islam. Remember, right? If you remember the story, the tribe of Hawazin, the Prophet ﷺ had their women and their children. Now, the tribe of Thaqif, where did they go? Where did they run? Back to their castles, back to their camp. But Hawazin does not have the camp, so Hawazin fled helter skelter. Hawazin just ran away. So Thaqif, they're in their castles and fortresses. Many of their women and children are saved. But Hawazin, all of their women and children are captured. All of their property is gone. So the Prophet ﷺ was hopeful that they're going to have to come back to negotiate. So he did not distribute the spoils of war. He just left them, took care of them in Jirana in a valley. He basically guarded them, put 200 people there, guarded that, and went to Ta'if. Ta'if did not uh, work out, came back to Jirana, waited, they didn't come. How long are you going to keep it? So eventually he distributed all of the property, all of the people, he distributed them amongst the Sahaba. Then lo and behold, the next few days, Hawazin comes and says, we're sorry, we're Muslims, okay, can we get our stuff back? That's what they did. So what did the Prophet ﷺ do? Human situation. Every person who now has a property, a slave, money, he's not just going to hand it back. Somebody just got handed $10,000. You're going to come to the next day, oh, you know, can I have it back? You feel now an attachment, right? And this is expensive property. This is hundreds of camels, hundreds of, you know, and, and then you have the, the slaves as well, which is very expensive at the time. And so many people um, uh, became wealthy uh, in this battle. So what to, to be done? Here's what you call human psychology. So Hawazin came to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, as for what I have and the family of Abdul Muttalib, I can speak for them. All of this back to you. Oh, excuse me, before he, before he said that, sorry. He said, which is more beloved to you? Your families or your wealth? What will anybody say? They said, yeah, is there even a question? Of course, our families. Why? Because he knows he cannot give everything back to them. 
You cannot return everything. You're going to have to sacrifice. You came late. And I can't take everything from their hands. But I can take a little bit. So which is more beloved to you? Your families or your property? They said, of course our families. So he said, okay, help me out then. Tomorrow after Salat al-Dhuhr. When we pray the Salah, or it doesn't say Dhuhr, after the Salah, most likely it's Dhuhr Asr. After the Salah, tomorrow, stand up. And make this speech. Tell the people you converted to Islam. And tell them that, Ya Rasulullah, we ask you to be our Shafir, our intercessor with the rest of the Muslims to give our property back. And O oh Muslims, we ask you to intercede with the Prophet to give us our property back. I mean, not our property, but our families back. Okay? So, notice the psychology here. When everybody prays, how do you feel after salah? It's religious, right? You're all praying together. There must have been 10,000 people behind the Prophet salah. So you choose the right time, the right place. Right after salah, you're feeling peace, right? You're feeling connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then emotional appeal. Because the Prophet does not want to command them. Why does he not want to command them? Tell me. It's not fair, it's their right. It's their right. They just got handed a lot of wealth which is their prerogative. And then to tell them, sorry, tough luck, hand it back, it's going to be painful. So what does he want to do? He wants them to be generous. He wants them to follow suit with what he's going to do. So he brings about the psychological situation, the tender heartedness, right? The right time, the right place, the right emotional appeal. And so they stood up after the salah, they gave their speech. Immediately the Prophet stood up. Again, there's emotional, there, there, there's, there's, you're playing with the, 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 the psychology of these new converts because as for the elite of the Sahaba, he could have commanded them. No problem. How about these new converts? What's going to happen with them? We will see what happens with them. So he stands up and he says, As for what I have in my family, the Al of Abdul Muttalib. Now, Al of Abdul Muttalib, he knows exactly who they are. Then they are back yours. No problem. Right? As for the rest of you, O Muslims, then you see your, the situation of your brothers. He just calls them your brothers. You see ikhwanukum, their situation. They're asking for their own wives and children back, right? So whoever can give it from the goodness of his heart, let him do so. Alhamdulillah, Allah will reward him. And whoever is not able to do so, then we will try our best to, to free them with the next amount of money that comes. Right now he's, khalas, it's all gone. He's given everything. He doesn't have anything to give now. So he says the next batch of ghanima or fay that will come, then will you will be the first recipients by purchase by hire. Basically to free the, the, the slaves. So immediately the muhajirun said, Ya Rasulullah, Saul, fi sabilillah. After the muhajirun who's going to stand up, the ansar, all of them stood up and said, fi sabilillah. So the elite of the sahaba, the righteous of the sahaba, they all gave it up. But then the new converts, many of them, they said no. Only with money. Only with money. And some of them said, Fi sabilillah as well. So the point is that, Alhamdulillah, a large percentage, there was no money involved, so it makes it easier for the Islamic treasury. Right? And then those that wanted the money, it's their haqq, it's their right. And this shows us that even the ruler cannot just confiscate property. This was their legitimate right. They fought a battle. They earned that right of wealth. And now they're given their share. Now they can't just give it. They cannot just be forced to give it up. So the Prophet ﷺ then said, whoever you know uh, wants it to be basically with the, with the money back, the next time we get any money, you will be the first recipients. And therefore, uh, eventually all of the uh, family members of the Hawazin were reunited. And subhanAllah, isn't this amazing as well that these were the same people that set the trap. These were the same people that attempted to kill the Muslims just a few weeks ago. These were mortal enemies. Now they come as Muslims. And there is no doubt that the main motivation for them to accept Islam is what? Defeat and family. Right? There's no denying this. But the Prophet does not. Khalas, you're our Muslim brothers now. End of story. Because, and we say this over and over again, Islam is true. So however you accept it, eventually it will come into your heart. Islam is the truth. 
And these people now, their iman might be weak. Their iman might not even be existent. Like Allah says in the Hujurat. So the Hujurat, وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانِ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Iman has not even entered your heart yet. It's not even entered your heart yet. But it will enter your hearts. Because after all, where are their, where are their descendants now? All the righteous Muslims of the world. Right? That's what happens. Iman comes in to the heart. And therefore, what uh, this new group of, of Sahaba were treated with the type of generosity that we expect from our process. And that of course helps them accept Islam as well. And another story, we did not, I did not mention this last time because we did not have time, that when they accepted Islam, our Prophet ﷺ said, where is your leader? Malik ibn Auf al-Ansari. Now Malik ibn Auf al-Ansari was the same one who insisted to bring the women and children against the advice of the elders. Remember, that was Malik ibn Awf al-Ansari. Where is Malik ibn Awf al-Ansari? That was the, the main leader who instigated the attack, who led the attack, who had the tactic of, of you know, the, the, this, the uh, bypass, that, sorry, the, the overpass. That was all from Malik ibn Awf al-Ansari. So he said, where is Malik ibn Awf? Awf, they said, he managed to get into Ta'if. So he is now in Ta'if. So the Prophet ﷺ said, go tell him. That if he comes to me as a Muslim, I shall return his family and property, plus give him 100 camels. Blatant price. Come, get your women back, get your children back, get 100 camels. And so when Malik heard this, it's a no-brainer. He's lost everything. He's lost his tribe. He's lost his family. He's lost his wealth. Now he's being told, if he comes back to the Prophet ﷺ as a Muslim, then khalas, not only will he get everything back, he'll become a multimillionaire. It's a no-brainer. What, you, what else are you going to do? There's no life to live without your family, without your, your, your children, without your property, what else, without your tribe. He's the chieftain. Without your tribe, what are you going to do? So he has no choice. He comes to the Prophet ﷺ, he accepts Islam, and the Prophet ﷺ reinstates him as the tribal leader, subhanAllah. The very person who instigated the whole, and this isn't the first time this has happened. Who can remind me of another time this has happened? Where the whole tribe fights, and then they embrace Islam, and then the leader goes back to the same leader. Banu Haritha. Right? The Banu Haritha, the wife of the Prophet the, the Maymuna. The, her father-in-law was the chieftain. And the same thing, they're all prisoners of war. And then instantaneously, they're all freed, they become Muslim, they get their property back, they go back basically to the same land, the same people, everything. And this isn't the first time. And wallahi, what an amazing stories we have of our seerah. What other civilization can say this? What other civilization can say this? That the same person who fought against the Muslims, now he goes back with his tribe, with his family, with his property, and everything is status quo, except that idolatry is gone, and they're Muslims. And in fact, uh, Malik uh, ibn Awf al-Ansari, he then versified some lines of poetry, basically saying that the Prophet ﷺ truly is a prophet, because he didn't have to do this. Yet he fulfilled his promise, and he gifted, and he was generous. So this is what money does to people, right? This is the reality. When you see the Prophet ﷺ giving millions of dollars, the equivalent, millions, and not taking one thing in his own pocket. What does that demonstrate? That's what Al-Aqra ibn Habiz, the other chieftain said. When he went back to his people, what did he say? He said, come, he said, Wallahi, this man is a Nabi, for no king would do what he has done. No king would give all of his money. I have just come from a man, he doesn't care about faqr. He doesn't care about faqr. What man doesn't care about faqr? I care about faqr, you care about faqr. Right? Everybody's worried about poverty. I have just come from a man, it's no concern of him how much money he has, doesn't have. This is only a Rasul. It's only be somebody of that level. So when you're so generous and you're so good to the people, you are going to bring their hearts to Islam. And that's exactly what uh, happened with the tribe of uh, Hawazin. And this was the general rule of the process is to try to find another benefit here. You can add another benefit. Try to find local leaders rather than put leaders from other. Look at what he did with Malik. The same leader of the tribe becomes the leader of Hawazin. Why? Because it is human nature. You will respect somebody from within your own ranks as a leader. You're not going to respect somebody from outside. It's human nature that somebody of your own ranks, you can take him as a leader. He knows you, you know his lineage. You, uh, if you have a, a, another ethnicity, another person come in, it's difficult to accept as a leader. Also, 
Who better to rule than somebody who's already ruled? Malik ibn Auf knows how to rule his own people. He knows the, the people in charge. He knows the elites he will need. So he's handed back his basically his power. And he's told to now become the chieftain of the same tribe that he was the chieftain of in the days of uh, Jahiliyyah. Another point uh, that we, we talk about in the battle of Hunayn. And I've been delaying this point for a very, very long time. And some questions have even come up in the last, how long? Three years I've been teaching Zir alhamdulillah here. So we've kind of delayed this. I just want to give a brief talk about this now, uh, and maybe, maybe someday we can give a longer lecture about this, but the issue of the prisoners of war brings up the very, very controversial issue of slavery in early Islam and in Islamic law, and this is a very hot topic that obviously uh, critics of Islam uh, and even Muslims that don't know the Sharia that well, they always bring questions. One of the questions I always get asked uh, about from our uh, you know, young men and women is, what does our religion say about this? How do we read these books of uh, the seerah, of the Qur'an even, uh, which mentions Malakat Aymanukum, the, the right-hand possessions? What do we say about all of these things? Now, uh, this is a very long topic in and of itself, and it is a very controversial topic. Uh, and the first thing is, I don't like using the term slavery, because the English term slavery comes with a connotation in Western history that the Arabic term and Islamic terms never had. The very term slavery is historically loaded. And when we use the term instantaneously, we get images of Hollywood movies and whatnot of American slavery, which was honestly, historically speaking, one of the worst manifestations of this institution in human history. Even the ancient Romans treated their slaves better than uh, what we saw in this land 200 years ago. And this is a historic fact which everybody acknowledges. That the way slavery existed, especially in this country, was really the worst manifestation of that institution in human history. So when we use the term slavery, automatically that type of image and scenario comes up. Whereas that never existed ever in the history of Islam, even in the history of many other cultures, that version did not exist. So I don't even like, I don't even like using the English term. Rather we can use ubudiyya or riq or something of this nature, which is the Arabic connotation. Now, uh, we need to look at the issue of riq from two angles. Firstly, within the context of their times and what did Islam do? And then secondly, within the context of our social, political, ethical, the, uh, ethical uh, laws and, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the banning of the institution of slavery in the modern world. So firstly, within the context of their times. Within the context of their times, we need to understand that slavery or riq or ubudiyya was a universal practice. No culture or society had banned it ever in that period. In the, uh, in the Middle Ages, early, uh, in, the, uh, pre, um, uh, in the Roman societies, Greek societies, Chinese societies, Indian societies, it was rampant around the whole globe. And Islam was the only and the first to institute laws for ubudiyya. There were no laws for ubudiyya, for riq, before the coming of Islam. And Islam was the only civilization to come and give a set of laws about dealing with uh, riq. And of those laws were to limit, the, to have checks and balances put into place by number one, restricting where do abs come from. And Islam restricted it to one and only one source. Prisoners of war who are not ransomed. Every civilization in the world allowed abs to be basically captured in other lands who were free and then capture them as a free man and then sell them as what happened over here. You just go into a land and you just take somebody, force him into riq and then uh, bring him as, a, uh, as an abd, as a prisoner, as a, as a slave. Whereas in Islam there was only one source, a legitimate war that is fought and a state fights another state. You have these five, ten thousand prisoners and there's no ransom to be paid. Nobody's paying their ransom. What is to be done? You cannot just set them free. They're going to come back to you, right? What is to be done? You take them as as abd, as uh, in the institution of riq. So that's the only source of getting riq in Islam. The second uh, law that was done is to legislate proper treatment, which again was unheard of in any other civilization and culture. There are numerous ahadith about treating abs, treating amas in a humane manner. About ex quite literally hadith in Bukhari says that your slaves are your brothers. 
إِخْوَانُكُمْ خَوَلَكُمْ Right? They are your brothers. Feed them from what you eat and give them uh, uh, and give them to wear from what you wear. And that is why in Islam there are many instances of you can't tell the riqh from the master. You cannot tell that. And in Islam, uh, well, leads, leads me to the third point as well. And that is that Islam legislated the freeing of slaves through multiple avenues. So many penalties. A false oath or testimony, breaking your uh, fast in Ramadan, so many things. What is the penalty in the Quran? The Hadir or Qabatim, the free a slave. In fact, it legislated zakat money, one of the eight categories of zakat, wa fir riqab. Imagine the highest institution of money, which is zakat. One of the eight is freeing a slave. That's not something to be taken lightly. So Allah Azza wa Jal said, you can use your zakah for freeing a, a slave. And in fact, not just zakat and penalty, it is one of the highest virtues of Islam. There are chapters, even in the book we are reading on a daily basis, which is Imam al Nawi's Riyadh al-Salihin, there are chapters, the virtue of freeing a riq or an amma. There are chapters that you are told that one of the ways to free yourself from Jahannam is to free a slave. And that's why Aisha and others, they would be hunting for riq to free. So it's a virtue in our religion to actually free an abd or an amma. And fifthly, we can say that of the uh, interesting things of our law is that it created a legal framework that incorporates treatment of riqs and ammas, but it doesn't require their existence. So if we eliminate the whole institution of abds and ammas, the Islamic sharia is still valid and intact. There is no legislation that requires an, an abd. Don't, there's no legislation that requires the existence of this institution. And therefore, in our times, when there is no such institution as slavery, Islamic law is full and valid. And it doesn't need their existence. And this is an amazing point in my opinion that clearly demonstrates that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, intended for this institution to be something that is not necessary and required. If it's there, there are laws that governed it for 11, 12 centuries. Now that it's gone, we don't need it. Those institutions don't need to be brought back. And that's why I don't know of any scholar in our times that is calling for uh, this institution to come back. So... Looking at now, of course, there's also the issue of uh, having conjugal relations with uh, the Ammas or the female slaves. And this is obviously, as usual, a very sensitive topic that many people find problematic, Muslims and non-Muslims. But once again, all societies and cultures had the exact same rule. It's not something that Islam came with. It's not something that Islam was new about. Every society and culture had the same rule. In fact, there's plenty of references in the Old and New Testament. And are we forgetting our own father Ibrahim alayhi salam? What was Hajar and uh uh, the lineage of the process goes back to Hajar. This is something that even the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, talk about. But previous civilizations and cultures, they did not have any rules. And in many cultures, including pre-Islamic Arabian culture, your Amma couldn't, didn't just have to be yours. You could lend her to other people, astaghfirullah. And of course what happened was you would then hire her out to other people. And this was the common practice. That your Amma, you would hire her out for a night. You understand what I'm saying here? And the Qur'an references this fact, that this is haram. The Qur'an references it, you cannot do this. So the Qur'an came and legislated things even in this regard. That if you have such an Amma, then she must be only yours. And children born in Jahiliya days were considered to be sometimes slaves. Whereas in Islam... The child born from such a union will always be exactly 100% the same as a child from a marriage. And that's why Ismail and Ishaq are both equal in the eyes of the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ismail and Ishaq are both equal. And in fact, if you look at our own history, the majority of the Khulafa were born of slaves. The majority. And that's a huge thing to say. And go back and check it. The majority of the Abbasids and the Uthmanids, the majority of the Abbasids and the Uthmaniyun were actually children of slaves. And what does that indicate? That their lineage that from the mother's side was not something that brought a stigma to them. It was something that brought no stigma to them. And also, if a child was born of such a union, immediately the Amma was upgraded. A free upgrade is given to her. She is no longer an Amma. She is called Ummul Walad. 
This is the books of fiqh have a chapter called the chapter of Ummul Walad. What is Ummul Walad? Ummul Walad is a special category of Amma. In that, you cannot, after this child is born, sell her to anybody else. She's only yours. Because now that she's a mother of a child, that's Ummul Walad, the mother of the child. She's no longer treated like anyone else. She becomes Ummul Walad and she cannot be. Uh, transferred ownership or sold or or, 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 or or anything of this nature and she becomes free on the death of the child's father. So as soon as the child's father dies, then she becomes automatically, with his death, she becomes free. Now that's a very interesting law that did not exist in any other civilization and culture. The point being that, yes, I understand this is a, a difficult topic for many of us, especially our our young minds to, to grasp. And the fact of the matter is we don't have to deal with this in the modern world. Allah Azza wa Jal legislated something that for the time and the context was the most humane possible. And everything seemed to work towards eliminating this institution. Now that it is eliminated, Alhamdulillah, we don't have to call for it to be brought back or whatnot. It is now gone from... Uh, and by the way, uh, Riq was abolished in Muslim lands from 1870 onwards. So it was recent. Not like in Europe or whatnot. In in Muslim lands, you had uh, abs for uh, a little bit longer. And in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, and then 19, 10, 20, 30s, uh, there were abolition movements as they were in Europe as well. And there was opposition to them, just like there was in Europe as well. And many Muslim clerics opposed the opposition, right? Opposed the abolishment of riqq. Because they said it is Islamic. And some forward thinkers said, no, we're modern times, we don't need it. And so eventually, alhamdulillah, as we know, it has all now been eliminated. At least we can say it doesn't exist in the form it used to. Some can say some of the workers that are in some countries, they're treated like slaves. That says something else, right? But the, the, the institution of abd or ubudiyah, it is now gone. The bottom line, yes, wallahi, it is a very difficult issue to wrap our minds around, uh, but it needs to be said and, and explained because we've talked about this so many times and this was the reality of the uh, situation throughout the world and our religion came and legislated it, made it far more... Uh, humane, if you like, than any other civilization. In fact, no other civilization had laws about these matters. And our Sharia, I've just summarized some of the laws. Obviously, every book of fiqh, by the way, every book of classical fiqh, there's a chapter on ahkam al riq ahkam al abd ahkam al amma. There's chapters about this, and you can go and read about uh, those chapters uh, for historical value if you want to. In our times, as we know, it is now uh, gone. And nonetheless, even in the seerah of the Prophet, notice how many times were the the uh, slaves freed, and our Prophet himself never had a personal slave khadim. He never had a slave khadim that he would, yani, uh, every slave that he had as a servant or whatnot, he would free. And um, uh, a number of the slaves that he had, when he freed them, they at- attached themselves with him. And they just volunteered their services to him, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, there was Maria al Qibtiya. Uh, and Maria al Qibtiya, uh, there is a different opinion about her Islam. Did she remain a Copt or did she accept Islam or not? Uh, and Maria al Qibtiya was not a servant, as you know of the process. I said he did not have a slave servant. He did not have a servant that was a slave. As for Maria al Qibtiya, then there was there is an ikhtilaf. Did she accept Islam or not? And we'll get to her uh, later on. Uh, but in any case, he did not, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, ever have a personal uh, slave servant of his own. Uh, and then the final point we'll mention about the benefits of the uh, story of uh, Hunayn and Ta'if. If you remember, we talked about the conversion of the single most famous poet. Who was he? The conversion of the most famous poet in all of Arabia. Ka'b ibn Zuhair. Hassan was the poet of Medina. Uh, Ka'b ibn Zuhair converted to Islam. Farazdaq did not convert to Islam. Correct? Farazdaq is, yes, one of the, you, what am I saying? Astaghfirullah. Big mistake. Farazdaq is Umawi. The one I'm thinking up, of is, um, who is the one uh, in the north part of, I forgot the name now. Yes, Farazdaq is way after. The most famous poet alive at the time of the Prophet is Ka'b ibn Zuhair. Ka'b ibn Zuhair. And after the battle of Hunayn, he accepted Islam uh, after a few weeks after that. He came to Medina and he accepted Islam. So this is not on the plains of Hunayn. We talked about his conversion story and his poem 
is called Banat Su'ad, right? Su'ad appeared. And Su'ad is, of course, the female figure, right? There's Now, uh, this is a little bit of a deep point, and I, I hope it's not misunderstood. But it needs to be said briefly, and maybe in some fiqh discussion we can go more in detail into this. But what I wanted to say, pre-Arabic poetry had certain motifs and mannerisms and styles. And some of those motifs and mannerisms and styles are awkward to say the least. For example, every famous Arab poem, pre-Islamic poem, always has a love story. <laughs> Dare I say, every poem in our times is about love, right? Rap, mute, what is it all about? Every single famous Arabic poem, by and large, right, has some type of... In fact, I, it's not even Arab poetry. What is poetry and drama and whatnot, except that usually there's some love things involved, Correct. This is the reality of our human situation. And pre-Islamic poetry is no exception. I mean, what is, what is the beginning of the Mu'allaqat? Should I quiz our elder sheikh here? What's the first line of Imr al-Qais? First line of Imr al-Qais. Qifa nabki. Qifa nabki min dhikra habibin wa manzili. Right? Qifa nabki min dhikra So let us stand here and weep. Looking at the... Uh, place where our beloved used to be. So he's weeping, looking at the tent and the walls that the Habib used to live in. Okay? The what? Yeah, so it's just looking at the ruins. Looking at the ruins, right? You remember your grade 12 poetry now coming back to you, huh? It's all coming back to you. Right? Like, so, and, and this is all of the Mu'allaqat. Now why do I bring all of this up? Because in this poem of Banat Su'ad, the poem Banat Su'ad, I mean, remember the... the um, uh, Asif, I have to ask you, what's the most famous line in this poem? You in particular. The Muhannad, the Hindi, that's all I remember. What is it? It's as famous to some people. <laughs> that's a very valid point. <laughs> I would say it is the most famous line of the poem. But not because of the Muhannad, it's the first part. For us, we'll take the second part of the, the couplet, right? Yeah. Inna rasula la nurun yustawa'u bihi. إِنَّ الرَّسُولَ لَنُورٌ يُصَدَعُ بِهِ مُحَنَّدٌ مِنْ سُوفِ اللَّهِ مَسْلُولُ That uh, the Prophet ﷺ is a light that people seek uh, the light from. And he is the Indian sword, Muhannad. So Muhannad is the, the most, the highest quality sword. The, the sword from Hind, Muhannad. Uh, and we talked about this and the pride that every Indian should feel now about the term Muhannad of the swords of Allah. Now, why am I bringing all of this up? Because if you actually read this poem, as is typical, there are paragraphs about Su'ad and the love that this man uh, basically has for Su'ad, right? Kaab has for Su'ad and descriptions of the beauty of Su'ad. Now, this type of terminology we wouldn't think when we think about poetry of the Prophet, correct? But Kaab is a brand new Muslim. And he's writing one of his most famous poems. In fact, this was his most. This became his most famous one. Banat Suad. Suad became visible. Suad is now uh, gone from us. Like so, he's ta- talking about uh, the the pain and anguish of Suad. And there are lines in this poem that some of the more conservative Muslims that are ignorant of Arabic literature, which is, I think, the most of us conservative Muslims, would find problematic. You understand what I'm talking about? You have a love poem here, right? What am I trying to get at? SubhanAllah, there are styles and techniques and wasilas that are used. Sometimes there are things present in those wasilas that you don't necessarily like. Our Prophet did not correct him. Don't have this, delete that. He didn't correct, just let it be. It's not the time and place to do this, right? And this is a bit controversial because other poetry he did correct. Other poetry our Prophet did correct. When the poetry was... Uh, Incorrect was kufr sometimes, right? Uh, or 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 too much of an exaggeration. So the the poem in Sahih Bukhari uh, that some young girls came to the Prophet on the day of Eid and they began playing the duff and singing and the banging the duff. And one of the lines of the poetry was Wafina Nabiyun Ya'lamu Ma Fil Ghadi. We have a prophet who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Now that's going too far. That. Is a theological deviation. Our Prophet ﷺ said to these young girls, 
get rid of this line and the rest of it is fine. This hadith is in Bukhari by the way. Right? وَفِينَا نَبِيٌّ يَعْلَمْ مَا فِي الْغَدِي We have a prophet who, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Now what am I saying here? It's problematic because I'm not going into detail what is and what is not allowed and that really requires some fiqh discussion. All I'm saying is sometimes in some places you can't have 100% sanitized version. And we have to especially keep this in mind in the modern world that we live in. When things are being done, people are doing da'wah in ways, maybe I wouldn't do it. Maybe I wouldn't even approve of it. But they have their ways of doing da'wah. And there's going to be some issues that have problems in them. And again, this is not an open light for all types of da'wah. It's case by case basis and there's going to be a difference of opinion. All I'm trying to say is bring highlight to is if you read this poetry, I can guarantee you almost any conservative Muslim who has never studied classical Arabic poetry, as for those who have studied, they understand this is genre. They understand this is how classic Arabic poetry always has a woman, uh, you know, beautiful lady, descriptions, love. This is the way poetry works, right? But for most of us who have never studied that type of stuff, if you were to actually read this poem, then you realize our process was, it was being recited to him. We would just balk, oh my God, how is this even halal? Even though the poem is very famous because it, it, it eventually leads to the Prophet ﷺ and praising him. So you always begin with the love poetry, you work your way to the subject matter. That's what Kaab uh, did as well. And we conclude now, what were the results of Hunayn and Ta'if? And then inshallah we're done for today. The results of Hunayn and Ta'if were, number one, a clear victory in the Hijaz, the entire region of the Hijaz of our Prophet ﷺ. Even though Ta'if, even though Ta'if was still uh, not Muslim, it was a small island of shirk in the ocean of Tawheed. The entire Hijaz region had now converted to Islam. Idolatry had been eliminated publicly. There's no idolatry publicly anymore. Yes, Ta'if is still pagan within their castle. It's only a matter of a few months, they will also embrace Islam. And therefore, the battle of Hunayn was the very last battle between Islam and shirk. That's it, it's gone. After the battle of Hunayn, never did the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba fight against the Mushrikun of Arabia. It's gone now. The next battles are now Rome, Persia, you know, others. This, the conquest will begin. Egypt, as for shirk in the Arabian Peninsula, Hunayn was the final domino. Khalas. Conquest of Mecca and then Hunayn and that's it. Arab idolatry ceased to exist within less than a year. And this is one of the biggest miracles of the Sira itself. Arabia was a land of idolatry. And within 22 years, idolatry, per- there are no more Arab idolaters. They're gone, khalas, completely gone. This was a miracle that no human could bring about. Our Lord brought about complete wiping of shirk in Jaziratul Arab, and of course the uh, and of course the uh, final benefit is the tribe of Quraysh in totality having embraced Islam. There are references, by the way, you should know as a footnote. Perhaps one or two or three of the Quraysh fled to Rome or other places, and they died obscure deaths, and that's it. End of story. But all of the elites that remained had to convert to Islam and that is exactly what happened. And with that, Central Arabia had been conquered. The only major province of Arabia that was left was the northern province. As for south, they are not idolaters. They are the people of Yemen and eventually will be conquered uh, in a peaceful way as well, not much bloodshed. Uh, The major battle left will be with the people of north and Allah will that they will not actually fight. That's the battle of Tabuk will happen there. That there's not actually going to be bloodshed taking place and the people will feel the power of Islam and realize they cannot fight it. That will be the battle of Tabuk and inshallah we'll begin talking about the battle of Tabuk inshallah ta'ala from our next Wednesday's halaqa.